This is the city of Bunth, on the coast of Sierra Leone. Once, Bunth was a major trading post for the British Empire in West Africa, with enslaved people and commodities like palm oil leaving its ports for different parts of the world. Now, it's a sleepy fishing town and the local capital of the spectacular Sherbro Estuary. It has also become one of the front lines of climate change in Sierra Leone. Semi-flooding has been taking place within this community. If this one had not been made within a period of 10 years to come, all these houses would have been cleared. A few years ago, Bunth built a wall to cope with rising sea levels. But other towns on the Sherbro Estuary's coastline haven't been so lucky. With less resources, many of these towns are struggling to cope with the onset of climate change. To better understand the impact of global warming in Sierra Leone, I visited some of these towns, working with local reporters to find out what people are doing to adapt and what's changed in recent years. When I was young by then, this place was bigger, but because of flooding and this climate change, we are affected by this, by the sea. The place flooding is affecting us, really. In towns like this one, Hanging Site, people are building makeshift barriers to protect against flooding during storms and high tides. The more we try to build walls here, the more the place gets spoiled. But they're often poor protection against the power of nature. Well, normally what we do, we go into the bush there to cut the mangrove, to build this place, to block there, to build a wall, so that flooding will not affect us. Yeah, it works for a time, and later on it still continues. Mm. One of the best protections that people here have against climate change are the mangrove forests that sprawl for miles in every direction. Their deep roots can hold flooding at bay. But they are also a critical part of people's livelihoods. Their wood is used to smoke fish and construct new houses. This puts people in a tough position. Well, the consequence of cutting this particular thing is it creates, is, is actually dist, uh, destroying the environment. It encourages uh, global warming. Then again, it also gives way to flooding. Between 2015 and 2021, USAID tried to help, paying people to plant mangroves to replace those that they cut. In some towns, the young mangroves can still be seen, but others haven't fared so well. No, they don't stop it. Yeah, they can't stop it. Why? Because now we live here. Mm -hmm. We can sell the mango tea, and we dry fish with it, we cook it. So we know for stop. In this town, hanging site, Miata Morlu, who helped plant the mangroves through the USAID project, says nearly none of the seedlings survived. The one that we left? How many? We got it. Think on our Okay, about 50, about 60, because the goats, the animal, they may not. So uh, uh, the highest, now 60, we don't left. Yes. Uh -huh. So out of 1,000 trees they planted, only 60 are left? Yes. USAID's struggles here are an example of how difficult climate finance can be in practice. When environmental aid programs don't address the underlying causes of destruction, they often struggle to show long-term results. Trapped between the consequences of climate change, a problem people here did almost nothing to create, and the costs of environmental damage that's a part of their own survival, people in Sherbro say they're worried about what the future might bring. So if I'm worried about our present situation, I must be extremely worried about the future even for our children yet not unborn. Things have become so worse like this. The place has become hot, and we are using this type of behavior, manhandling the environment. The time all of us would have passed away, I wonder what is going to be their own fate.